epic to chat to you. Um, this is a uh, you know a video podcast series that um, myself and Justin Malseed from Zildjian Australia have kind of put together. Mate, it's been awesome. We've just been chatting to drummers and um, drum nerding out, which is which has been a really fun time. So it's huge to get you on, man. Dark so arts. How, the dark arts, mate. So how are you going? Where are you at right now? Is this your home studio yeah. or? Yeah, I am in Los Angeles, and this is my my little writing room where I'm surrounded by toys at, at all hours of the day and night. Nice. And um, what are you currently working on? Well, uh, a few things actually. I'm working on my solo music per usual. I've been doing a lot of writing and production sessions for various people. I usually do a couple a week. Mm -hmm. I recently wrapped up a film score and whatever goes with all of the above, you know, filming stuff, editing stuff, just keeping busy. Yeah, epic. Now, um, you've got a lot going on by the looks of it. And from hearing that, you've even got more going on that I, I can even imagine. And... Um, I thought I'd kick this off by saying we have a mutual friend in Chris Lewis. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go, yeah. Go, go way back. Yes. I know you do. I um, yeah. I played drums for Unwritten Law in 2020 in Australia. Mm. I did their run uh. out here. And um, yeah, Chris is a silent assassin. Like he doesn't say much about kind of what he's done or anything like that. But I was looking up some photos. I was just doing some research on you and... Um, I noticed you're in some pictures with Chris Lewis. I was like, there you go. Small world. Oh, yes. You'll find, uh, let's see, uh, anywhere from a 14-year-old me to probably a 21, 22-year-old me with Chris Lewis occasionally. No way. So you, you guys, yeah. like you spent a chunk of time together, like a bit of Phoenix TX. What, and... And he, he was in a band with you and your brother. Oh, you didn't play in Phoenix TX? You just no, no, no. In I, I just, or? whenever Phoenix TX gets mentioned, I, I want to yeah. just throw in an unfortunately in there. But yes, yeah, so what happened was, is Phoenix TX split up whenever that was another lifetime ago. And mm. half the band formed one band and half the band formed another. And I was in one of those halves that turned right. into a band called Denver Harbor. So Chris Lewis was in that band and I was in that band from, it was a short lived experience, but I was in that band from 14 to 16, I believe. So a lot of early time together. And the Phoenix TX thing came about because there was a tour mm -hmm. where Denver Harbor was supporting Phoenix TX. And for reasons of a, a blurry memory or just not really caring that much, the drummer was sent home for whatever reason. And it was either the tour stop or I learned their entire set and play twice a night. So that was my, my short foray into the, the uh, disorganized world of Phoenix TX and all related <laughs> parties. <laughs> Epic. Now, um, I, I think it's, you know, it's an interesting part of your journey because you're only young still. And, you know, I was reading that you're the youngest living member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is I believe that's correct. And that's just ridiculous. Um, you know, and then I started deep diving into what you've done. Cause I kind of, I mean, I love angels and airwaves. So I, I really oh, cool. uh, became aware of you when you started playing for angels and airwaves or when you joined angels. Um, and then before that, I was aware of you from, from the drum off as well, like the guitar wow. center drum off. So I was doing some research. I kind of thought it, you know, started with the drum off and then everything kind of rolled from there. Everyone was like, this guy's ridiculous. Who is he? Let's get him in our band. I kind of thought that's how it rolled, but looking further into it, it seems like you were already in all the bands and you did the drum off once you were kind of rocking with, with Nine Inch Nails and whatnot. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's a funny thing because when you hear or see the words drum off, you mm. assume it's a competition. Now, of course yes. it was, but I, I was invited as one of the guests for the event that was thrown for the final night. So it was a, it was a nice venue in LA I think I believe now it's called either it was called Club Nokia it's called Club Nokia now or now it's Microsoft something I have no idea but right. anyway Guitar Center made a, a big event of the finals and they would have other guests play and if I'm not mistaken I, Josh Freeze was originally supposed to play that as well I don't know why he did it Aaron Spears played that night mm -hmm. and numerous drummers and at the end I believe was the actual 
competition segment of it. But yeah, I mean, if if memory serves me correctly, that was 2011. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd already been in Nine Inch Nails for a couple mm-hmm. of years, and I, I I had either just or was about to join Angels and Airwaves. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, by that point in my life, I'd already been You're around rocking. the block quite a few times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mate, you'd been around the block by the time you were 14 years old. Like it's just insane. Well, it's funny when you say that I'm still somewhat young. I'm like, you got to tell that to my inner self because I feel about 80. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what. I was yeah. talking to somebody at uh, DW the other day, and I had been, I have endorsed their hardware and pedals for a long time, but it wasn't until it came up in conversation where I was like, it's been about 22 years since I've endorsed drums and hardware, which you do the math. And I was 12 years old when I first started working with them. And it's just, it's one of those things that while you're in it, you feel like, okay, this is great. Let's keep moving forward. Let's keep expanding. And, you know, you have, you have your whole life ahead of you, mm. but it's not until you look back where you go, man, maybe I should have, um, not been quite as anxious about everything, but you know what? Maybe that anxiety has led me to the other places I went to and where well, I will go in the future. Yeah, I'm sure that anxiety and drive is, you know, I've got to do more, I've got to do more, I've got to get there, I've got to get there. It's just led you from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, like mm. very quickly, like really, you're young, you're yeah. young. And, yeah. And I'll say, thank you, but I will say it was never, ever my intent to be one of those guys who was in numerous bands. I mean, it's a uh, lot of the bands that I play with and the, more importantly, the people in the bands, I, I just get along with everyone so well. And it makes the whole experience fun and something to look forward to. Mm-hmm. But growing up being somebody who worshiped bands of legendary musicians, I always saw myself as the guy who would be in a band. And that's the one thing I would do. But I suppose the world just unfolded in a different way. And, you know, I'm happy about it. It, it. I'm glad it turned out the way it, it did and, and will, but not something I anticipated because I look at people like uh, Josh or uh, Brooks Wackerman. Um, you know, we're all we're all friends, but the, and those guys being a bit older than me, I always saw the sort of two career paths as being the, the drummer in a band or being the guy who plays in numerous projects at all times. And I never, ever saw myself as that guy. But yeah, it's been fun. It's been Mate, fun. that's that's interesting. Two thoughts come to mind. First thing is, I I felt like that too. I always wanted to just be in a band. I think that mm. when you grow up and you start doing it, you kind of realize that you, you somewhat need more than just being in a band. Like there's, you kind of want more opportunities outside of just that band for many, mm. many reasons. And the other thing is, someone that's without blowing smoke up your ass too much someone that's as good as you people are people are going to come knocking on your door and and the the offers that you're going to get at which you have got you're not going to say no to you're just going to go shit well i'll do i guess i'll do that as well <laughs> you know thank I mean? you yeah yeah i mean yeah. I, I i i'm a, i'm aware of, of how fortunate i've been but yeah you know things uh, you, you plan for something and then something else happens yeah i mean um it's kind of cool you mentioned josh i, I mean he's kind of had somewhat of a similar uh, history to you in the sense that he was like a phenomenally great drummer when he was a kid and he just went from band to band to band to band to band to band to band and just everyone knows him. He's the guy. And mm. yeah, I feel like you're the guy as well. Like you are the guy. Mm. Um, so that's re- that's really cool, man. And it is it's it is interesting to see that you are so young. You, you have already done so much. And like the bands you're playing in are, are across generations. Like... You know, spanning decades, um, which is really cool for you to. It must be cool, man. Like playing for Nine Inch Nails and kind of seeing the fans that love Nine Inch Nails. You being probably younger than a lot of them, but they're probably bringing their kids to the shows as well. And then you're playing with Angels. Like it must be kind of cool jumping between, say, say those two bands and just the differences in, I guess, the music and the differences in the types of shows you're doing and, and things like that. Like, is that fun yeah. kind of jumping from one to the other? It's a lot of fun. I mean, there's, there's a common thread with everything I've been a part of as far as a live player and that being 
energy. Obviously, there are different types of energy, but when it comes to the drums, I've always been in a situation where I can give it my all. And mm -hmm. dynamics being fairly high most of the show are just one of the things that feed into the overall energy of the night, and that's been great. I would, at some point, love to do something that's more dynamic in the opposite direction, just because it's not something that I've done live before, any sort of... Mm -hmm softer playing or, or different styles of playing has either been in the studio or for my own music but it is great bouncing back and forth because there's a dip for example whereas angels and nine inch nails might both be energetic as far as the drumming's concerned there's a different intensity to nine inch nails mm -hmm. and there's a certain energy in a lighter way with with angels and airwaves but they're both tremendously fun to play drums to and be a part of as a drummer Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of stuff. And for my, my very, very brief time with Paramore, which I'm shocked that, that people still mention 10 years later because it was so sort of finite moment in mm -hmm. time. But same thing, you know, different, for example, poppier, rockier stuff. But mm -hmm. as far as the drumming was concerned, very, very energetic. So yeah. I feel like the transitions, although the bands have been incredibly different, as a drummer, everything was a very smooth sort of transition. Yeah, I'm hearing you. I, um, I think with the, the Paramore thing, I think people mention it so much because your drumming on that record was, was wild. And, and because, because you do play open-handed, like your parts are somewhat unusual for kind of right-handers to learn. I've had a mm. few students at my drum school um, take on Ain't, Ain't It Fun in particular. And... Mm. Um, you know, there's just some little little bits and pieces in there that are just unusual and it kind of blows people's minds. And the last episode of this, I actually had Aaron um, Aaron Gillespie on and he was oh, talking yeah. about having to learn your parts um, and how much of a headache that was because of the, your unique style of playing. Like he had to get a, a floor tom on his left, which he never had before. Um, and uh, he actually mentioned there was one time where you guys were playing on a festival or something together and you were watching him play your part side of stage. And he was like, super like, Oh my God, Alan's watching me. Like, I, ho I hope I'm doing okay. <laughs> Which is sick. Cause Aaron's such a beast. Yeah, um, he's a really nice guy as well. But I will say uh, that that is very true in regards to certain things are just naturally easier when it comes to being an open-handed player on a right-handed drum set, just ergonomically you're open and mm -hmm. not that that was done by design that was just me being a naive child when i started playing and this didn't make any sense because mm -hmm. this was closer and easier mm -hmm. that's that's as far as the thought process went to being an open-handed drummer mm -hmm. but as far as the parts on that album i have to tip my hat big time to to taylor york because a lot of patterns specifically were programmed mm -hmm. that was one of those things where it's like i programmed this can you do it? Is it weird? And a lot of those things actually coincidentally worked out that I was able to play these slightly odd parts more freely because I was open-handed. But a lot of things I'll, I'll play right-handed naturally, and it is odd. But a lot of homework was done on their part in terms of coming up with drum ideas and then handing them to me and seeing if I could play them. Mm -hmm. as they were programmed or if I thought anything else would perhaps be better or different and that all that all took place in the pre-production stages but I'm glad you mentioned Ain't It Fun because that's a, a, an example of a song that was probably one of my favorites to play and it's fairly fresh in my memory because that's one of those songs that you go to the supermarket and it's, it's playing yeah. in the background for for whatever reason but I hear it and it's got such a good groove yeah and it's so funky that that's not the sort of thing I have done in any other band. I may play mm -hmm. that way in a room when I'm just having fun, you know, no pun intended, mm -hmm. but <laughs> to actually, to actually do that on a track, I feel like it just showcases a different sort of feel rather than being yeah. out of 10. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that's, that's cool. So, so, so with that record, you mentioned they had a lot of programming done and gave it to you and then you kind of worked with them and figured out the parts. How long was that process? Is that like a thing where they're like, we've got three days, we need you in here, let's go. Or is it like, we're recording in a, in a month, let's kind of work on this, you know, for weeks. 
It was somewhere in the middle. I think we had probably a week, if not, uh, let's say a week, give or take a day or two of mm -hmm. pre-production. And then we went straight into the studio and tracked it. Yeah. And was like tracking the drums, is that like a four-day thing, three-day thing? That one, it's the only it's the only time I've ever recorded this way, but it was absurdly luxurious. It was too luxurious. Whereas right. we, we did about a song to maybe three a day, which, you know, funny enough, Carlos de la Garza, who still works with the band in a, you know, engineering, I, I believe mixing in a co-production capacity, but on that album, he was the engineer. Mm -hmm. I just did an album for him last month and I did 11 songs in a day and yep. we were out of there, you know, right. so to, to do something so sort of leisurely was odd to me, but playing drums in a studio is fun. So it wasn't something to complain about. Nah, man, that's, that's, that's the dream. Like not, not being in a complete rush mm. in a nice studio. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. So on the side of all that, you mentioned you just did a record for somebody uh, recently. So you still do session work. Like can a band call up Alan Rubin and go, we've got 10 songs. This is our budget. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, I actually enjoy sessions quite a bit for numerous reasons. Obviously, the material can be fun to play, mm -hmm. but it's nice to have a tremendous amount of focus on something and then it's out of your mind. It's gone. Mm. And I would generally, obviously, depending on the project, I'd much rather go into the studio for a day or two than, say, go on tour with you know, be that guy who just fills in and does little spot dates here and there. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying I haven't done that and I wouldn't do that, mm -hmm. but it's just very convenient to sort of get all these tracks, learn them, chart them out, go in, work your ass off for the day, and then it's over, forget about it and move on. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, I'm, I've been very busy getting a lot of my own solo music together, but mm -hmm. it's kind of not done until it's out. You know, right. so to be able to work on something and just shut off when that last track is done is very satisfying to me. N not overthink it and, and, and yeah. sit on it for, for a long time. So you're obviously, you, you play every instrument, basically, guitar, bass, keyboards, programming mm. stuff. Like you, you do everything and vocals, obviously, as well. Um, mm. Man, it must be an interesting kind of, it must be interesting for you kind of figuring out how to s spend your time and what to kind of work on, I guess, because obviously you love working on your own stuff and then you've got all these other bands that you've got to kind of write for as well. How do you kind of manage that? Do you, is it like the kind of thing where you ch you block it off in chunks, like angels are working on something, then that's done. And then, you know, you might tour with that and then work on your own stuff in between and you do your own stuff. Like how, is that kind of how you, how, do you, can you do bits and pieces in between? Can you like, do an Angels gig, then the next day write a song, then the next day do another Angels gig and then come up with something for Nine Inch Nails. Are you like that or are you just do you have to kind of block it off? I don't block it off. I mean, the things that need to be prioritized naturally work themselves out and mm -hmm. make it to the to the top of the heap. So what I mean by that is, is Trent wants to go on tour, Nine Inch Nails is a priority. Tom mm -hmm. wants to go on tour, Angels and Airwaves is a priority. And that becomes the focal point of everything that I'm doing. But of course, no matter what it is, at least for me, it's not a 24 seven time consumption. Mm -hmm. If you rehearse, if you play uh, a show at night, there's so many hours in a day. Now I'm not quite the guy who, if he's not working on something, he's going to go insane. I just genuinely like to work on stuff. And almost more importantly, I always need to be learning something. And mm -hmm. because I'm always learning something musically, whether it be uh, instruments, pieces of music, production techniques, whatever it may be, it all kind of funnels into what it is that I do, whether it be as a songwriter, a producer, performer, w whatever you want to call it. And mm -hmm. as a result of that, I'm always working. But I think a good example is... The last time Angels and Airwaves toured, which was, I mean, it feels like ages ago, but it was only 2021, late 2021, I think. But mm -hmm. on that tour, I pretty much scored most of Tom's movie that should be coming out sometime this year. 
And Dang. that and that was more of a really had to make the best use of my time. So any venue that had a spare dressing room, I would mm-hmm. set up MIDI controller, laptop, some speakers so that he could listen and then just work. And I would work after sound check pretty much up until an hour before the show. Then after the show, I'd kind of listen to the work that I did and then save and pick it up the following day. And those two things are completely different. Mm. You know, the, the energy that goes into playing a, a show for angels and then writing some whimsical, adventurous orchestral music or whatever it may be. But it's like the time is there. You just have to decide to use it. Yeah. I, I do understand the mentality of, okay, I'm on tour and I'm not writing right now. I'll write when I'm back home. But I don't see why that needs to be the case. If, if you have yeah. an idea or if you have the ability to work on something, why not? Mm-hmm. Man, that's really cool. So when we first started chatting, you said you just wrapped up a film score. So that's the film mm-hmm. score for, for what's Tom's movie coming out? It's it's to the Stars Academy. Is it? Yeah, the the movie is called Monsters of California. Now, mm-hmm. I am certainly not a spokesperson, so my timing would probably not be accurate. But I'm mm-hmm. hoping. I heard something around june maybe but i've also heard so many other dates that i chose not to care until it's actually out <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah gotcha gotcha now you, you did say one thing that was interesting before about learning i'm just going to pull up the zillion mm-hmm. website words of wisdom for the next generation of drummers number two i would advise anyone who is serious about music to constantly learn and never think that learning impedes creativity <laughs> first of all i've never seen that thing before i, mean, I don't <laughs> even re- I, I don't even recall filling it out but right but uh, hey it this, sounds like something you would say because you just kind of said it does me using the word advise make me sound like a prick like i'm giving somebody legal no no <laughs> no 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 that, that you probably said something and they paraphrased it or whatever but mm. um that's i think that's really cool man because i have heard that um you know you, sometimes you hear musicians that are self-taught or whatever say that you know they taught themselves how to do this and and they have this unique sound because they didn't have lessons or they didn't learn this way or that way or whatever and then sometimes you know as a kid when you you want to start learning you're like oh maybe i I shouldn't learn off someone because i want my own kind of thing and that's what this guy did or that girl or whatever i think that um that quote's really cool man like just yeah elaborate on that a little bit well i'll tell you what i I, it's not Anything creative is not a one-size-fits-all, but I absolutely disagree with and detest the idea that learning something properly or knowing the rules, so to speak, impedes creativity. And it's not so much with drummers. It's more so people who write on on more melodic instruments. Uh, Guitar players, oh, I don't want to learn scales because it's going to ruin the way I do this. Or I don't want to learn theory because then then my music's going to sound like textbook. And Mm. all of that is so nauseating because, Mm. first of all, the arrogance to assume Mm. that this person's creativity is so otherworldly that (laughs) even even a general knowledge of the building blocks of music is going to hinder their creativity is ridiculous. So... And then any wise person will tell you uh, rules are meant to be broken, but you got to learn those rules and figure out how to break them properly. If you do something badly because you don't know what else to do, then who wins there? But mm. if you if you if you decide to do something a little unorthodox and there's intent behind it, that's that's what brilliance is. You know yeah. how did how did somebody go from here to that and make it work? You're never going to find that in a rule book, and mm. that goes for like I said, anything creative. But it's literally the same as somebody saying, I don't want to learn how to, how to, I don't want to learn grammar because it's going to impact the way I write or yeah. speak. And just, just so stupid. Yeah. You know? Mate, that is, that is a hilarious way to describe it. You just cut through the crap, mate. That's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> I love that. That's very funny as well. Um, before you were talking about Trent, you were talking about Tom. Two just iconic guys. Ridiculous that you're in a band with those guys. Like that's wild, right? Uh, <laughs> Question. Yeah. Off the top of your head, I'm gonna throw it straight at you. What what is something that you've learned 
from both of those guys. So say something, what have you learned from Trent? Uh, uh, maybe about music, about life. Like, is there something that when I ask you, what have you learned from Trent? Like, what's kind of special about him? What, what's something kind of maybe unique that you've learned from someone like that? Or is there something that stands okay. out immediately? Well, it's tough because when I think about Trent specifically, what comes to mind is just his personality, obviously, but the way he, he presents himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a, he's a funny guy. We get along great. But there's this sense of focus all the time, pretty much. And that is something that I really appreciate and has always resonated with me. And, you know, even looking at Nine Inch Nails, it's been coming up 14 years now since I've been with Nine Inch Nails, which is crazy, but mm. that's what comes to mind is, is the guy who knows what he wants, who's willing to put in the time and effort to accomplish it. And even when it's going well, how do we make it better and how do we change it for the next time? And, you know, whether that's something, it's certainly something to learn from. I've just, I've always appreciated it. it it's, it's more of, a liking of, of the way he, he runs his ship rather than thinking I learned how to do mm. that from him. It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. in terms of, in terms of learning, he's got such a, a, a broad scope of work that it could be something as simple as like, how do we get that sound on mm. something? Or mm. how is he evoking this sort of feeling from that instrument, whatever it may be. And of course, in terms of, of stagecraft and just giving it your all, there's there's something there to learn. Now, mm. Tom is an interesting guy, and, and I mean they're both interesting guys, but in the complete opposite of ways. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Tom is funny all of the time, mm. and it's almost hard to pin him down to. I don't want to say to work because he's constantly working on something. But let's say we have rehearsal at 11. It might be 1 o'clock before we actually hit a note because he's showing photos of horses on his phone or that, that are funny or dogs looking like they're driving cars or whatever it may be. And then yeah. we get to the work. Right. You know, and so, so in those regards, they're, they're complete opposites. But mm -hmm. when it comes to, to music, I mean this in the most complimentary way possible. It is amazing to me what Tom has been able to extract musically from what he likes and what he does. Now that could be misconstrued or, or taken in a backhanded way. And I don't mean it that way at all, but there are, there are so many great songs in history that are written using the same chord progressions. Right. Mm -hmm. And Tom is able to, or has been able to write a lot of songs in similar veins that each do something a little different. And I think the fanaticism of a huge part of his fan base is, is evidence of that. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's able to just reinvent the thing that he does that, that people have loved for, you know, a couple of decades, almost three decades now, whatever it's been. Mm -hmm. And that is impressive because our Trent has a very, He's got a, he has a studious musical upbringing. Now, I don't mean he's some, you know, he's working out theory, but if he wants mm. to talk harmony or figure out chords, he knows what he's doing and he can, mm. he can construct things in a, in a sophisticated manner. Whereas Tom's like, I have mm. no idea what I'm doing. I put my hands here. This is the melody I sing and I like it. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and it's, a, it's impressive. And when, cause, cause Tom and I have a, a collaborative relationship, you know, I don't, write anything with Trent never have I mean, he mm -hmm. obviously knows what he's doing and he and Atticus have a have a great thing going mm -hmm. and, have, and have had a great thing for a long time but Tom and I as collaborators had to find a common language because I couldn't tell Tom or he couldn't tell me hey I like this thing that's CFG or what's another chord or this and that Tom mm -hmm. almost describes music using every other terminology but music itself Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it, it, I had to find the sort of the filter to translate what he was trying to communicate. And then once mm -hmm. we, we got there, I think we've had a very 
fruitful writing relationship and the two albums that we've done I think have showed a lot of evolution and growth and I'm and I'm proud of them mm-hmm. but he and I and he said this many times I mean where is opposite as they come in terms of uh, music musicianship whatever you want to call it taste mm-hmm. we're very different people musically whereas I, I do think Trent and I have more common threads musically in terms of, of taste but mm-hmm. All of that's irrelevant because when I put out my solo music, it doesn't sound like either Nine Inch Nails mm. or Angels and Airwaves. So mm-hmm. everyone likes what they like. They incorporate it to what they're doing and it comes out as, as their own. And mm-hmm. Tom and Trent, as, as worlds apart as they are, they're incredibly distinctive. And mm. that's also not something you can learn. You just do it yeah. and they did it. That's cool. Is Tom like Trent in the sense that like he knows what he what he wants? So I, I feel like with every great band, there's at least one person in the band who's like, I want the lighting like this. I want the stage looking like this. I want us to walk out like this. I want, you know, <clears throat> I want it to feel like this when you're in the audience. Like is, mm-hmm. is Tom as in-depth with that as, as Trent? Or is Not it just quite. different? It's different, and yeah. and and Tom is very very good at describing what he wants, but it's it's more in a in a general mindset. This is what yeah. I'm looking for. I want it to feel like this. Mm-hmm. Whereas Trent is very detailed and mm-hmm. in the weeds with everything. When you started with Nine Inch Nails, and you had someone like Trent, like who knew everything, knows every hit that's going on, knows every lighting hit, like every cue. Was it quite intimidating? Um, I mean, coming out and you know joining a band like that for a start, being young also, and then also having someone who's like a living legend, but he's on to everything. Like you can't really let anything slip. You know, like was that kind of intimidating at the start, or or not really? Honestly, I mean, it's it's a mixture. I don't want to say intimidated. In the sense of like, oh, my, there was an yeah. excitement uh, of of having fulfilled the opportunity of being there and being in the band. But mm-hmm. perhaps I'm most confident when I'm playing drums. So I always mm-hmm. have this feeling of like, all right, now I'm gonna now I'm gonna show them what yeah, I can do and how prepared I am. But what I will say is that I think Trent and I both pride ourselves on on preparation and execution. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. I knew when I walked into that rehearsal room for the first time, I was going to nail it. And that's the way I always operate as a drummer, as a musician. I don't, I don't half-ass it. I don't go in being anything less than totally prepared. So Sick. when you think about it, I, I had auditioned at some point in the winter. To, no, no, I don't know what it was. Late, late 2008, and the first rehearsals were... January of 2009. So I had a few weeks to learn 40, 50 songs, whatever it was. Mm. And when I walked in, I just knew, okay, I'm ready. And I'm excited to, to do it. Mm. And, uh, I know that was appreciated and what can I say? And it paid off. You know, I mean, that's, yeah. that's great advice for any, any drummer listening, like, you know, being a hundred percent prepared, so you're not you're not mm. really even you walk in there and you're not nervous. You're like, I've got mm. this. I've done the research. I've hit all. I've learned all the little nitty nitty gritty bits. I haven't come in and just learned eighty percent of it and mm. I'm throwing my own fills and stuff. And then you're just nailing yeah. it. Yeah, and you know, in terms of fills, I will have something to say there. Um, mm. Obviously, Nine Inch Nails have very distinctive yeah. drum parts, rhythm parts, whatever they may be, and mm. those are very hooky parts of most songs. So those Mm -hmm. do have to stay exactly as they are. Mm. But any time I have played something that a drummer before me played, Trent has always advocated that I not do that and do whatever I want to do there. So it depends. You know, there's some people who want someone to come in and do their thing, but I always cautiously approach joining a a band for the first time is I don't want them to be nervous about anything. I don't want to do anything that feels uncomfortable or, or new, so to speak. So I'm Mm going to play exactly what was 
done before me. And if mm-hmm. they want me to change things up or make it more my own, I'm always happy to do that. But that is the way I usually approach things. Man, and, and, for- and insane lesson there as well. Mm. Insane like Thanks. It, that's the way that's the way that's the way to do it. If you auditioning for a band, joining a band, play what's there and then mm-hmm. feel out what they want and then adjust as you go. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, yeah. and and when you were talking about the uh the sort of I don't know how you phrased it, but if there was intimidation of finally getting into a mm. band like that that was it was legendary and, and so on and so forth. It sound this is one of the things that sounds bizarre in hindsight as a as a wise thirty four year old, but as a twenty year old who had been playing for twelve years at that point and had already been in a in a handful of bands by that point, I was so sick of a lack of professionalism in everything I had done before that. Mm-hmm. So when I finally had the opportunity to be in a band that was on top of it. And, and perfection was the goal. I was like, oh, finally, this is the kind of thing that I've wanted to be a part of. Yeah, that's that's cool, man. And it's cool that you found that, and you found it young, you know? Like, mm. that's, that's sound, it's very fitting. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of electronic uh, elements in Nine Inch Nails, and I'd assume you were already kind of on top of that stuff as well. You were already mucking around with, programming your own drums and playing MPCs and things like that? Well, it was a, a, f- a perfect time for me because I had just gotten into electronics. I mean, when I when I joined Nine Inch Nails, if I'm not mistaken, I had a micro Korg, I had a chaos pad, and that may have been it. A handful yep. of, of pedals. I mean, what I've acquired since then is disgusting, and I love all of right. it. But but the the gateway had been opened, and when I joined the band, I was exposed to the finest of you know people who know how to use these tools, and then mm. the tools themselves. Because especially that world, and by that I mean since drum machines, we are or have been in a sort of golden age where there are both new products and reissues of legendary products that you couldn't get your hands on a while back. And now there's, there's too much, I would say. Mm -hmm. And when you get into more niche aspects of electronics, whether it be modular synthesis or all these boutique manufacturers that make all these different pedals and, and modules and things, now there's so much of it that you can you almost don't know where to begin, you know. And when you join a band like Nine Inch Nails, where gear is everywhere and everyone knows how to use it and play with it, hmm. it was a it was a great learning experience for me. And it's always great to have Trent, Alessandro, Atticus be like, "Have you played with this thing yet? Is that good? Should I get one?" You know, that's <laughs> that's very convenient. <laughs> that's huge. And yeah. you came from. I mean, your brother's obviously in the music industry as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I read that you started playing drums on your father's kit. So I yes. assume your dad was a drummer? He was, yes. Very nice. And what, like, was he... Tell me about that relationship with, with you and your dad. Because my dad was a drummer and a drum teacher as well. And mm-hmm. I know lots of drummers oh. have, have got that. I just think uh-huh. it's, it's pretty fascinating. So what's your relationship with your dad being a drummer? Like what, what was all, tell us about that. Well, it's interesting because drumming was never, certainly never forced on me. And, and to the origin of me playing drums wasn't even something that was encouraged. And what I mean by that is, yes, my dad was a drummer when he was in high school. But the combination of him having a kit and me being the youngest of of three boys, two of which had already been bitten by the music bug and were playing instruments, I think it was a combination of access and then seeing them do it, thinking, I I think I can hit those drums. I think I can do that. And then as I did it, my dad realized, you know, he's not just making noise there. Let me teach him a couple of things. And then I, I feel like, 
that perhaps revives an interest in music and drumming within my dad. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of cyclical. I mean, to this day, I get a rough mix of one of my songs done. I send it to him and he'll Sick. tell me that my vocals, my vocals not loud enough and I need to do something yeah. else here. And then, you know, <laughs> it's, Thanks. it's funny, but, but yeah. So once he realized I had a natural talent, then it was encouraged and the immense support from my parents obviously directly led to my early start with drums also being a career path. It was instilled in me that, yeah, drums are fun and music's fun, but if this is what you want your life to be, you take it seriously and you do the best you can and mm. always realize that everything is a potential opportunity. And those things have, have stuck with me since then. But yeah, I don't think my parents before having kids thought that they would have a family that was so music centric, but that's the way it turned out. And, and, you know, and speaking of my two brothers, uh, my, the middle brother, Danny, he played bass with me live when I was doing solo music as the new regime. He played with me for years and we toured a bunch mm -hmm. and my oldest brother, Aaron managed me for a long time up until just a couple of years ago. But he always engineered, mixed, and co-produced all of my solo music. Now he still mixes and engineers a lot of my solo music. But he's also become Tom's sort of right-hand man since I joined Angels and Airwaves. So he's mm -hmm. been working with Angels ever since I joined, or right after I joined. He's currently working with Tom on his Blink stuff. He was involved in the movie as well and did additional music for it. Mm -hmm. And he has kind of just positioned himself whether it was on purpose or not he has now gone into the the, the production side of things you know the, yep. the sonic aspects the the really nerdy nitty-gritty of music whereas before mm -hmm. he was a player and on the business side now he's he's a studio rat and he's staring at a monitor all the time and, and mixing so wow there's just a, there's a constant uh working relationship there in fact before you and I got on, we were FaceTiming about how I need to back off of my microphone when I'm doing vocal stacks because we get buildups in the, in the low mids. And so it's, it's always, <laughs> it's always, uh, you know, a, a process in motion. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I've, it's so cool that you've got your brothers that, that work in music and you can talk to them at that level because mm -hmm. I feel like with music, I mean, there's only, you know, you have, certain people you can talk to about what you're doing and, and what's going on and, and specific things like that. There's not that many people you can, you can, you can call mm. up and be like, Hey man, you know, what do you think about the mids in my mic? Like, do they need to change? You know, it's a handful of people. So it's pretty cool that you can talk mm. to your brothers like that. Um, and that you are kind of essentially in, you know, you're working together, which is, that's cool as well, man. Like yeah, on, a, absolutely. on a big level, like it's, it's not, you know, you're doing it. That's very cool. Yeah, and when you've worked with somebody for that long, there's a, there's an unparalleled honesty in communication. Yes. You know, which yes. is very important. Honesty but we always... and, and you speak no, the sorry, same sorry. kind of, sorry, you can speak the same language and get to the point quicker, I guess. Exactly, because, you know, he knows what I, I love musically, and if there's something I'm listening to now and I'll hear a recording, I'll be like, I think I know what you're going for there. Let's, let's... Let's see how we can do that. And it works out. Of course, with me living in LA and him living in San Diego, which is where I'm originally from, I'm doing, I don't even want to call it engineering, but I'm putting microphones in front of stuff and I'm capturing audio. Mm -hmm. I get plenty of, what were you doing with this? We need to try doing it this way and this and that. Or if I have a piece of gear that's just, takes a shit and I go, wait, what do I do now? I have somebody I can call. Yeah. <laughs> Super handy. Um, mm. Speaking of like your drum videos online, like the drum cam videos um, yes. actually had uh, paralyzed by angels and airwaves transcribed um, and had a little, we'll, we can have a bit of a look at that in a second. Um, but I mean, the mix from your drum videos is epic. Is that your brother? Yeah, that yeah, that's him. He did all those, all the Nine Inch Nails ones. That's him. Yeah, they sound so good. I was wondering. I was wondering, are these like 
is it like a studio uh, what's it called studio drummer or, or 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 is this like just the sound of the drum like it's just being done that, so well man that is the captured audio so basically front of house records multi tracks of everything mm-hmm. every single night yeah. now i i didn't really know exactly what i was going to do but would put up a, a few gopros up every night mm-hmm. dump all the stuff on a hard drive and then when i got home i would go through things or if i had a night where i recall ooh, last night perfect drug was particularly good i'm gonna go look at that footage and see, see if it's as, if it's as good as i thought it was yeah and then when i'd find the footage and realize okay that's that's what i'm gonna edit so so i edited the video for those mm-hmm. and not not that it's anything crazy but i that's edited those clean. and yeah. then went through the because when you record those shows you basically have one long session of the entire show and i'd have to kind of find everything find the track get rid of everything else then save a session of that then i'd send it to Aaron, and it has everything and he would then but this is just raw audio completely untreated Mm. so when you open the session you hit play this is no offense to how it was recorded but it's just raw audio it's it doesn't yeah. sound good there's a lot of noise or some technical issues from somebody's wireless unit one night and there's a lot of stuff to to sift through mm. and clean up in terms of just the sonics mm. but we we then got in a workflow where once he did the first one and he he realized how everything was set up because angels recorded everything as well but every engineer every person who records or runs a session does it their way Mm. and as a mixer you then have to look at that and then organize it in a way that suits your workflow Mm -hmm. so he did that clean up all the audio and would send me a couple of passes of ask me and ask me what i thought of it and they sounded Mm. great yeah they they sound that's all him they sound so good that i was listening to paralyze paralyze and, and wondering whether like he grabbed bits from the actual recording and mixed them in. Like it sounds so good. I was kind of wondering how that was done, but obviously your brother mm-hmm. being who he is and the way you guys play mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sick. Um, <clears throat> mate, that's awesome. Um, Thank you. I, lo- I love a good quality drum video. I really, I really appreciate one. I love a nice mix. Now, speaking of how good your drum sound and your cymbals, right? Zildjian chats. We'll talk about your cymbals in a second. But mm-hmm. the Q drums, we, we got to talk about Q drums. Like, I mean, they sound ridiculous mm-hmm. on these videos. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that's, you know, a, a thing you've been working on for many years now. You are the mm-hmm. Q drum guy. So tell mm-hmm. us about your specific kit. Do you use the same kit for Angels and Nine Inch or do you use different Q drums or a combination? Uh, I, there are, I think a couple of kits that have been played in both bands Mm -hmm. and generally though each band has its own setup but there are certain situations where it just worked out where i have a a copper kit that kind of has like a it fades out into a black patina and i know i've used that in both bands but generally i use different kits Mm -hmm. i have a couple of copper kits a couple of a couple of copper kits, a galvanized steel kit, and then I have a couple of mahogany kits. Now, the mahogany kit I used in 2013, 14, and 17, I think, with Nine Inch Nails. Mm-hmm. Then a, whatever copper kit I used in Nine Inch Nails there was also used with with Angels and Airwaves. And I have a copper kit that has like a, a tri-band finish where wow. it's brushed in the middle and it's got patinas on the outer edges. Mm-hmm. That I used with Angels and Airways recently, but that is the kit that I took out with with Paramore all those years ago. Ah, so, sick. you know, it really just depends. And I, and I have a, a galvanized steel kit that I, I never got to use because I never got to use live anyway, because mm-hmm. for one reason or another, we either didn't have the time and it, it didn't make sense to kind of change the mix because obviously that affects everybody else. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, a lot of kits, they all sound great and they all sound a little different. Yeah, and with the Q drums is one of the kind of key things that separates 
that brand from other drum brands is it kind of the metal drums like the different types of metal drum that's like one of the key pillars that are different right absolutely and that yeah. is the thing that that drew me to the company because really it's hard to do something new with drums mm. it's mm. not like any other instrument where the accessory market is constantly expanding you know you may have a guitar but you have all these different amps, you have all these different pickups, you have different strings, you have different pedals, and there's so many things that can shift the sound. Whereas when it comes to drums, you have the drums themselves and you have the heads that you put on them. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of leeway in terms of invention. Mm -hmm. But Jeremy stumbled across an idea that was ingenious, and that was a hybrid construction with metal shells that were rolled and then riveted at the seam so they have a nice rugged look to them that i always enjoyed mm -hmm. but what gives them their distinctive tone is the fact that the re-rings inside of the drums are maple re-rings and they're cut with a proper bearing edge so the head sits on wood but when you hit it it resonates through the metal which is why the brass, copper, steel, stainless steel, all these different metals do have different qualities and characteristics to them. The same way maple, mahogany, and birch will all sound different. Mm -hmm. So I found that to be very interesting. And aside from that, his his artistry and craftsmanship in, in the various patina works that he did was really immaculate and impressive. Now, for people who haven't played metal drums, I mean, the most famous, historically speaking, would be Ludwig stainless steel kits, which I'd still love to own one to this day. Mm -hmm. I don't have one, but I'd like one. Those shells were rolled over the way a metal snare drum would be. So they were very live and, and loud. And that's a quality that I love about them, but it's a quality that wouldn't suit everybody. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's played a Q kit for the first time assumes they're going to sound loud and, and untamed. That they're going to be physically heavy. And it's quite the contrary in both instances. They're very controlled and they're very warm sounding. And all of that really can be attributed to the hybrid construction of the well-cut maple re-rings in there. They're, they are unique drums. They look unique as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's very cool that you're in that world uh, yeah. also. Uh, another little thing you've got your, got your you got your fingers in many pies, mate. You're doing you're doing a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Now let's pull up the uh, Zildjian setup quickly. All right, here we are here. All right, so let me just drag that across. This looks like a nine inch nail setup. Is that correct, or is this an angel setup? No, that is an that is a nine inch nail setup for yeah. sure. Yep. Quick question before we talk about the symbols. With those two uh -huh. rolling pads on the right, yep. why have you gone with those pads instead of, uh, you know, the other type of mesh pads? Is it so there's no mistriggering? Is that the vibe? Yeah, it's also that and they're far more rugged. I know when yep. I first joined the band, and also not pictured there, I do have two pads on my left side as well. Mm -hmm. So a total of four. But I did have these smaller little trigger pads that had a, a mesh head on them or mm -hmm. they had an actual drum head on them. And while that may feel good, they have a higher possibility of misfiring. So I thought, right. let's, just, let's just get these because they're tried and true and they're mm -hmm. cheap. So if they yep. break or if they don't trigger well, get rid of it and replace it rather than thinking oh, we have this thing and now we have to find this sort of transducer or that kind of head or whatever it might be to get the triggering to happen. Mm -hmm. I could have pulled transducer out of nowhere. I, I, but you know what I'm saying. Whatever, whatever, the, whatever the mechanism is that takes yeah. the, the hit and triggers the, the MIDI device, why complicate that? Yeah, exactly. And with that, are those pads going into, have you got like a Roland brain or something like that or are they triggering midi into a laptop and shooting out sound yeah. what is going on there they're triggering midi so the four pads yep. on 
on my left and right, you'll see the right to the bass drum pedal. That is an electronic kick, an auxiliary mm -hmm. kick. And then the acoustic bass drum and snare drum have triggers as well. So mm -hmm. on any given song, I get a MIDI change just as everybody else does because mm -hmm. everything has to talk to where playback is coming from. So when mm -hmm. that song changes, everybody's rigs change in accordance to whatever the set list is. Right. So my triggered and pad sounds change from song to song. So if I'm not mistaken, and admittedly, I did not set it up myself. That is a, mm -hmm. a very nice thing about Nine Inch Nails. Someone oh, else man. Does it, and, it's, that and it's is, great. That is a <laughs> headache right there. Like, that, that's it a certainly big is. Yeah. Yeah, because anybody who plays with with, a, with with triggers on snare drums is going to deal with misfiring because you don't want to have it too sensitive because then mm. you misfire more often, but then you don't want it um, not sensitive enough mm. and have it not trigger. So mm. you have to find that middle ground of being able to play dynamically but not miss out on the triggering. Mm -hmm. But it it often is a matter of tweaking as you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it, there's a lot going on there. I'd assume you guys would have a playback person. Yes. Yeah, that's super handy. Um, now symbols. Let's get there. Um, let's start with the ride. A lot of drummers I've spoken to have had a ride similar to that K ride. What? What? Twenty four. Like yeah. Twenty four K light. Mm hmm. That's like a go to for many. Yes. We'll watch this video of you playing Paralyzed quickly um, in a minute. Sure. We'll just watch like, you know, a minute of it. And because it's a pretty uh -huh. good example of how that that ride sounds like it's got a pretty good bow and a nice wash. Um, yeah. And then the, and then the crashes, do you kind of move between crashes or do you, are they are these staples? No, I mean, it, it is funny looking at this photo because based on the kit, that would have been 2000. 13 and 14 i switched to the the black mahogany kit that i'd mentioned earlier right but i'm looking at the a and and also the the k light 15 inch hi-hats are mm -hmm. a mainstay that i always have although i haven't used them on stage in a while and the reason why that is is because when the avidus line or avidus however you how do you mm -hmm. pronounce it I, I would say avidus there you go me too yeah when the avidus well, line probably came wrong. out <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, but when those came out, I was an early adopter of those, and I haven't really looked back. I love them, and they just have a very versatile but but vintage voice quality to them. And the mm -hmm. reason why that's become more important to me is everybody's taste changes. And earlier on, I liked brighter cymbals. Mm -hmm. And this, when I say earlier on, I mean... I'm, st I'm a career musician and it's amazing that Zildjian has given me symbols. So it's like, what can I try? Let's try these things. Let's mm -hmm. try those things. And I went all over the place, but generally speaking, much brighter than what I'm playing now. And the older I've gotten, I've liked thinner symbols and slightly darker symbols, not too dark, not like uh, the K special custom stuff. That's yeah, like, I know the ones. Yep. And, and and I have those and I love them and I think they're phenomenal on the right type of recording. But for what I do live, those would not work. So the Avidus line is one that is great in terms of they don't have this modern brightness, but they're certainly not too dark. They still cut and as a result of, of those two qualities, they're very versatile. But when I hit an Avidus 18 or 19 for the first time, I had this weird moment where... It triggered a memory from the symbols on my dad's drum set that I played on. He had this 18-inch Zildjian crash ride. It was vintage, and I hate myself for breaking it, but I was a kid, and he didn't give a shit, so I certainly didn't. Mm -hmm. But something in that symbol triggered my memory of, like, that's what that symbol sounded like. And it's cool to kind of have that connection to a tone, because generally I've had a very distanced relationship with symbols because that's the thing on a drum set that breaks yeah and i would hate to become too attached to something only to have it break and then get another one that doesn't sound quite the same so i've i've purposely been very detached but all the avita stuff that i've had and i have broken a good handful of them 
is incredibly consistent. And in terms of that vintage flavor, the Karope stuff is fantastic, and so are the Constantinople. So that's more of where my tastes have, have changed in the last few years. Gotcha. Yeah, I think I, I need to get one of those ride symbols. That's what's that's what's They're coming good. next to try. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now speaking of that, let's quickly have a look at you playing uh, with Angels on Airwaves. Things to note for people listening: just the incredible mix. Um, <laughs> the K ride. It's, you use the ball a lot. You wash on it as well. You crash on it. Yeah. Um, and then of course you're playing. I've got one question about this part too, but we'll just watch it for like a minute, um, and then we'll wrap things up pretty soon. But here we go. Sure. No problem. lots going on there it's sick um so you're obviously singing backups um and hitting some hard notes too like that's uh, that, i don't sing but that seems like it's not that easy to do that it might be easy for you but a bit going yeah. on there no it's an opportunity to get my my roger taylor on as i call yeah. it yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great <laughs> um do you get puffed when you're playing because obviously you know it's one thing to play tight it's one thing to play cool parts, play it tight, play it musically, put on a show, you're mm -hmm. doing you're going nuts, which is epic. That's what I love watching when a when a drummer plays. Then you gotta sing. Like mm -hmm. I guess that's another whole thing you gotta learn. Like don't gas yourself out. That is something that 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 comes up because you play the way you play and that may not be conducive to being able to hold your breath and because let's say you're out of breath by the time you have to sing, mm -hmm. you exhale quickly because you want to inhale more oxygen. And there is a bit of pacing there that only experience can can really yeah. help you out with. And it happens in Nine Inch Nails as well, where I've had to have moments where I go, okay, just watch it there because I'm going to have to sing right afterwards. Yeah. You know? Yeah, cool. And, and uh, another, another notable thing, your left foot is just going consistently. Mm -hmm. which um, a lot of people really struggle with um, mm -hmm. and find it very difficult to do. That looks like something that you just do a lot of. You've just worked I, on it. I credit that. I credit that to my dad entirely. See, He was teaching me to begin with. He said, always keep time, either keep it all the way through or bring it down with the snare drum, but always keep time. I don't know where he got that bit of wisdom from, but it has been tremendous for me. That's very cool, man. And I guess for your um, coordination and playing parts and stuff, having your left foot being active like that is obviously going to make things a lot easier too, because you can use your left foot mm -hmm. however you need. Yeah, and it just it just keeps you grooving. Yeah, more keeps uh, it rolling. Know, you're, 
your body's in a natural rhythm rather than thinking, okay, kick, snare, cymbal. You're just, something's always going on that everything else is revolving around. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and obviously we saw you playing open hand on the hi-hat there. Uh, and at mm. one point you cross over with your right hand and do like an open hi-hat, um, mm. which I thought looks cool as, as hell. It's, <laughs> it's very, very yes. sick. Um, was it... When you learn open handed, did you still learn playing fills? You know, often like if you work your way around the kit, you start with your right. Did you learn kind of like even rudiments and things like that? Like were you predominantly leading with your right? But when you would play rock beats like that, you would just use your left hand to to lead? It was a mixture. I mean, I can definitely recall clearly that when I realized, okay, this is the way I play now. There would be certain things where if it wasn't as easy as I thought it should be, I would try it right hand. And I thought, oh, you know what? That is easy as I thought it would be. So from the beginning, there was this sort of variation on the dominance. And when I started learning rudiments, because yes, I started out self-taught, but as I got lessons a few years into having played drums, I was learning more of rudimentary things reading snare drum charts, so on and so forth. But the great thing about rudiments is it forces you to be able to play both ways well. Mm -hmm. But I think a big aspect of drumming that everybody should dedicate themselves to is trying to even out the dominant and weaker side. Mm -hmm. And some people understandably find it very difficult and it's very uncomfortable to do, but I think a, a fun way of, of looking at it is you have a dominant side. So in my ha in my drumming, I would generally lead with my left, although there are many things that uh, I, I start with my right, a variety of fills, certain types of beats, obviously. In the choruses of this song, I'm playing right-handed, and I'm mm. playing on the ride, and then when I go to the highest, so I'm constantly open, but... There's a difference in feel. I mean, if I were to play on the hi-hat riding right-handed, it would have to sound different than the way I play open-handed generally. There's a different level of comfort. So a way of, of making people feel better about that is like you're kind of unlocking a different feel within yourself. You sound different when you are playing with your your weaker side now of course you can build up that side to where it becomes more comfortable but even if i was playing on the ride with my right hand or when i was a kid i used to have a ride up to my left regardless they would sound a little bit different but it's it's a cool you can it can definitely be an asset if you oh, thousand percent. If you think about it yeah you know like i because people can get sick of the way they play i'm sure it happens to everybody but mm -hmm. when you force yourself to do that and you hear it, you're like, well, it's still me, but it definitely sounds different. And that can mm -hmm. be fun, especially with me as a songwriter. It's cool because mm -hmm. different songs have different feels. And sometimes things just work out in a way where I'm like, I'm going to play it that way. Mm -hmm. Man, that's a that's yeah, cool perspective. Um, thanks. One last question. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, we'll wrap it up very soon. Uh, just My out pleasure. Of out of curiosity, right? <clears throat> you're... Phenomenal drummer, one of the world's best. Thank you. In terms of open-handed players, like you're the guy that comes to my mind every time. Like who's one of the best open-handed players? Alan Rubin. I think you're Thank number you. one. Um, <laughs> now, you know, you're young, which we've mentioned. You've already had an incredible career. You've done a, a whole lot, right? To get to that point, you've done a lot. Let Tell us about you learning drums as a kid. Like, were you in your garage or whatever on your dad's kit? Were you just in there for like hours at a time, hours at a time? Like, were you grinding your ass off as a kid to kind of get really, really good? And then obviously you've just continued. Um, yeah, like, t tell us about that. Okay, so I have an answer that you may not be expecting, but... Okay. While I did have natural talent as a kid, mm -hmm. I was never the type to be there for hours at a time. That being said, I would play in a cumulative 
amount of hours, but it would be spread out through the day. And I still work that way because mm -hmm. I am a firm believer in you get the most out of what you're doing if you want to be doing it rather than mm -hmm. forcing yourself to do it. Because there's definitely diminishing returns when you're doing something past when you should be. So mm -hmm. if it was a matter of playing drums for 20 minutes or half an hour, and then I'd go do something else and then come back and I'd play for another 20 minutes or a half hour. And mm -hmm. that throughout the day, every time I was playing drums, I was excited to do it. And I was in the proper mindset. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I still work that day that way. So when I'm doing stuff, if I'm writing a song, things would be going great, but then I go, okay, you know what? I'm going to go work on this other thing, or I'm going to finish that up, or I'm going to read this and learn that. And it, for me, it's proven to be a way of being very productive, but ensuring that I'm in the appropriate mindset because everyone has been there or been in a situation where they're working on something. It could be mm -hmm. recording. You know, mm -hmm. it's not coming to you. Rather than doing 800 takes or whatever it may be, walk away, decompress, come back, and you'll most likely nail it right then and there. And I think mm -hmm. that mindset of avoiding diminishing returns ends up being far more productive. Now, I commend the people who say I would rehearse for eight hours a day. That's mm. amazing. Mm. Just, just on uh, on appreciating a level of focus, mm. uh, I think oftentimes it's a lot of bullshit. Mm -hmm. But I was never that person. Now, yeah. if there was something I had to do, then of course I would make sure I had the time to be prepared. But like mm -hmm. I said, the mindset is far more important than the time invested, yeah. in my opinion. One last little quick thing. Now, when you're working on music and whatnot, are you, what would be the split between, say, you working on getting better at writing songs, uh, guitar, vocals, lyrics, um, all things mm. music compared to just drumming, right? So uh, mm. on the whole scale, what's yeah. kind of like, what would be the split between you just getting better at being a musician um, versus you getting better or practicing drum rudiments or something like that? Like, what would that split look like? Oh, well, that pie chart is constantly shifting. Now, yeah. <laughs> as, as disappointing as it may sound, the divide between me playing drums for the sake of improving versus mm. me bettering myself as a songwriter or on other instruments has long been majority everything else. Now, yeah. there's a good reason for that. One, I've spent a tremendous amount of time in my life touring, in mm -hmm. which case I'm out there and I'm playing drums every day. And it wasn't until, I don't know, let's say the last eight, nine years where I'd have a laptop and an interface with me and there were other things that I was working on. But mm -hmm. you know, before I started writing my own music, it was all drums on tour. And when I got home, that would be the moment where I'd play piano or I'd play guitar. And, and that was that. But the more songs I write, obviously I'm going to be playing drums on all of these, mm. but, and I'm not going to say that there isn't plenty to learn on drums. Of course there is. There's plenty to learn about everything, but the types mm. of things that you learn on other instruments for me benefit me in many more musical avenues than just improving at the drums. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm better at the piano and I learn more at the piano, that makes me a better composer and a better songwriter. And probably a better a guitar better, player. And, and probably a better drummer because you're better at those yeah, things, it, right? It, it, yeah. it certainly all feeds into each other. And I'm yeah. not saying that as an excuse for why I don't play drums as much as I play everything else, but I love playing bass. I mm. love playing bass. And when I'm locking into something, that certainly informs what I'm going to do on top of that as a drummer. And I feel like I'm constantly moving, but there isn't a a clear divide and I'm certainly not the schedule type where I go, okay, from one to two, I'm going to play the drums and from two to three, I'm going to compose. No. And that, and that also feeds into being in the right mindset. Yeah. You know, yeah. and everything does help everything else, whether you mm -hmm. realize it or not. Mm -hmm. But these, these days in terms of spending time learning something, my focus has been more on improving my 
my composition, whether it be orchestral or other types of film music. And that certainly helps my songwriting because it, mm. it, it alters my ear and perception of harmony and, and, and possibilities. So that's also a reason why these various things that I do musically are all entertaining to me. They're fun. Mm. I'm passionate about them all, but even though they're all over the place, they all somehow improve everything else that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fun, you know, and Mate, it's always, always improving. That was an epic answer. <clears throat> I knew that was going to be the answer. And <laughs> it was an epic answer. I loved it. I love it. Well, well thank you. Yeah. Well, brother, Hey, that's, that's been an incredible chat. I've, I've held you for longer than, than I, than I said I would. So I'm, I'm going to let you go. Nah, no and, problem. I get to it, man. But it's been a real, real pleasure chatting to you. And, um, mate, I'm a big fan of, of you and, and what you're doing. Um, yeah, I'm, I actually can't believe, like, I just wrote to you on Instagram and you're like, yeah, let's do it. I was like, oh, shit. That's awesome. Legend. Why not? Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, talk, yeah. I'll talk to anybody, especially about uh, drums and music. So why not? But thank yeah. you for having me. And I, I do appreciate the time. And uh, I enjoyed it.